Well, and what's important to me, you know, some of the some of our listeners who are working with what they would consider the athletic population maybe has a different view of how they're managing, you know, cardiopulmonary, cardi- cardiovascular things, you know, these, yeah. these types of screenings. And that you came out with a paper recently, uh, lead author on the paper titled Outpatient Physical Therapist Attitudes Toward and Behaviors in Cardiovascular Disease Screening, a National Survey. Yeah. And I'd like you to dive in a little bit about why you did that. What what question were you looking for? And then what did you find? Yeah, there. Uh, so, you know, kind of similar to the, the story I'd mentioned that, you know, I, 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 you know, I had some experience as a student where I was running into patients with really high blood pressures, uncontrolled. Um, I was seeing it again in, in residency and just hearing from friends of mine. And I know it's one of those things like you may think something's a problem, but you don't really know the scope of the problem until you actually get some real data. So I was limited to just personal anecdotes. And if I'm really going to try to provide a solution, I have to find out what's the actual scope of the problem. So we decided that a national survey would be the, would be the you know, right approach. There was some previous data published by Ethel Freeze um, back in 2002. Obviously, things in the profession have changed. And back then, there weren't as many PTs practicing direct access. So I thought that was also important to see, like, how how has that changed, right? Now now that we're, like, frontline providers, um, it's also, like, you know, and at that time we ran the survey, 14 years, uh, 14, 15 years after she launched her survey, so obviously our prevalence of hypertension has also changed, right? And the prevalence of obesity. So uh, that led to it. And, um, you know, and I also wanted as large a sample as I possibly could. Uh, her, her study was a great study. It was limited primarily just to clinical instructors who were affiliated with her university. I wanted just to survey the, the profession nationally uh, and get as many responses as I possibly could. Fortunately, enough people decided to, to volunteer their time and go through our survey. Um, and what we found was was pretty pretty interesting. Um, one, the the risk factor prevalence in in outpatient PTs was pretty alarming. Um, I think most most PTs reported uh, that at least half of their half or more of their current caseload had patients with moderate to greater risk or diagnosed cardiovascular disease. Um, the average age or the, I mean, if you, if you kind of break off the age demographics, most people are seeing an older population, older than 46. Um, so then that's also a bit of a risk factor in of itself, just having older age. Um, and more and more people are just encountering new patients. I think like 30% reported encountering at least one patient daily with high, high risk factors. And then the shocking thing is despite all that, how, you know, the, the high prevalence of risk factors, like 15% of the profession, um, or that survey, I guess I can't say the profession, but of that sample, um, which was close to about 2,000, we had 1,812 responses uh, just from outpatient. We have some others from other settings, which we're going to analyze soon and publish, um, that uh, yeah, 15% taken on every patient, which I thought was just like, if you look at just like what, people are self-reporting they're encountering and then what they're actually doing. It's just like, we've got some areas to, to work on here. Um, we found that uh, those who do routinely screen uh, a perception of importance was a, was a, was a strong factor for why they decided to do it as well as having a clinical policy. And the other side was uh, for those who didn't, it was, they didn't perceive it to be important and they didn't have a policy and um, those were the, so it's basically the opposite. So those who did had something they could use, right? They felt it was important, and those who didn't didn't think it was important. So which which is good and bad, right? It's bad that obviously people don't think these things are important, um, but it's just an opportunity really to educate, you know, and you know, and, and you know, beliefs are malleable to a certain degree, right? And we're de- we're dealing with an educated population here. We're dealing with you know clinicians. Um, what I did find interesting was uh, going through a, uh, and we pub- it's in the it's in the paper. If you went through a clinical residency or fellowship, you were more likely to screen, like exceedingly more likely. If you have practiced for a longer duration, 
you were more likely to screen. And um, if you saw an older and a more, um, uh, like a, I guess, a more sick population of patients with a higher risk profile, you are also more likely to screen, like exceedingly more likely, um, which is also speaks to the same kind of narratives we've seen a lot of things that the more often you see something on the forefront, right, like the more likely you to do it. So if you're seeing a work of a higher risk population, you're more likely to perceive it to be important and more likely to do these behaviors. So which, again, speaks to if we can really demonstrate to people that you are seeing patients that need to have these things screened, they'll probably end up doing it. And maybe a post-professional residency program is is the avenue to do that, right? Maybe it's maybe this like dedication to continue learning. So it, it's interesting. It's interesting. The paper is open access too for everybody listening. Yep. Um, yeah, cost is two grand. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's, uh, yeah, it's funny how that works. That's a different conversation. Yeah, yeah. But the, yeah, yeah. one of the other barriers to to screening was perceived lack of time. Yep. 37% perceived lack of time. Yeah. And I, I think that segues into the question of why vitals are vital. But let's say that you, we have a clinician who is working with a young, what seemingly healthy population that you would, you would deem a low risk just on their general demographic. And, they, and the clinician feels pressed for time. I know you yeah. get this question a lot. How do you address it? How do you address that question? It, it is, is your argument, you actually do have time and you should be screening everyone as just kind of like a, an initial rebuttal? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I think I've posted a couple of videos of this, how how little time it takes. Um, you know, we're talking about two minutes. I mean, I train first year PT students to take blood pressures. And I've done it at now three universities. Um, takes, you know, First year PT students can do it in two minutes. A manual blood pressure, um, you've got time, right? So that's that's one thing. But obviously, people are like, "Well, I'm really pressed for time here. I'm seeing 30 minute evals. No way to do it." Um, automatic blood pressure um, devices are as reliable and as accurate, and are actually less prone to some user errors um, and less prone to white coat hypertension uh, than a manual measurement. And you can do that in the waiting room. So the patient could take it or a medical assistant or a tech could take it. Um, so and there's there's clinics that do this. I have a colleague of mine down in Kentucky, Matt Lee, of Court, Kentucky Orthopedic Rehab Team. I used to work for um, them. Where, you did? I did. You know Matt? You know Matt? Uh, I know the name. I know the name. Yeah, I, it was like five years ago. Guy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He's a tall guy. So um, he yeah, they have a they have a policy there. I think they're techs or they're uh, assistants take it, and then the PT interprets it. So that's one way to do it. Um, or we could have the patients do it. Maybe you're a one-man show, a one-woman show. Um, you know, you, they could take it and you interpret it. And if it's off, maybe you recheck it again. Um, the other side is, you know, if it, I, the way I frame it, you know, it's, it's a systems review, right? And there is no way to assess if someone's blood pressure and heart rate and other resting hemodynamics are safe without assessing it right if someone came to you with like a like a like a ankle fracture or you know or a suspected fracture right you would you would screen those things right to make sure they're appropriate to begin exercise the same kind of concept for blood pressure and heart rate right you and the only way to do that is blood pressure and heart rate measurement um and there's actually papers that show that you you can't you can't go by like it published specifically for pts in a PT population, you cannot determine blood pressure from visual observation or a view of a medical record. Um, and then broadly, you know, there's patients, you know, who I mean, maybe even the other argument gets like, well, if they're on hypertensive medications, no problem, right? Like they're medicated, they're good to go. 50% of patients on hypertensive medications aren't controlled, aren't at their goal blood pressure. Um, they also don't necessarily affect exercise blood pressures either there's another argument i'm saying you know not only should we be taking resting blood pressures we should be taking it during exercise as well and see how they're responding and how they're recovering too and the other side is um yeah it, it's just i mean there's you know if, if there's 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 just so many reasons to do it and the other and if, if a patient 
God forbid, like has an acute event or something goes awry and you didn't take a measurement at baseline, like, you know, though that's rare, right? Very rare to happen. It only takes one incident, you know, for your, for you as a professional, like your professional career to change drastically or be come to a, a pretty sudden end if you didn't, were doing your due diligence. Um, so even though, it, you know, an athletic population, it's pretty low risk to have someone with risk factors. Um, I have, I have friends of mine, even 16 years old, where athletes have had, you know, kidneys were clear, heart was clear, had hypertension, like, and it's asymptomatic. There's, I mean, even at super extremes, it's asymptomatic. So it, it's, I think we've got two minutes to make sure that our patients are safe. So Considering that so a lot of the other things we do in practice, which is not a good argument um, necessarily, but there's a lot of things we do in practice which are exceedingly um, bigger wastes of time, I think, than screening the cardiovascular system. So, yeah. Is that is that the rebuttal to those two biggest barriers? You explaining that you do have the time; it's fast and and it's important because there could still be something there. You can't necessarily yeah. pick that up from the subjective history alone. Yeah. So it's not, 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 not even not necessarily. You can't. Like it's, it's impossible. You can't do it from the subjective history or the medical record review. Um, and then there's other strategies you can take to do it. Like you don't, I mean, there's ways to, if, if time's really a big issue, there are strategies to implement to make it more, to fit your, your, your clinic situation. Um, there's, there's ways to fit it in, you know, um, yeah. 